Today I want to share five small architectural wins that can make a huge difference for newer Unity developers. None of this is about frameworks or over-engineering. It's about making simple choices early that keep your project flexible as it grows. We'll start from some very typical beginner code, refactor it step by step, and I'll explain why each change matters, not just how to do it. Let's get into it. Let's start with some typical Unity code. Here we've got a player that directly references a weapon. The weapon directly references an enemy, and everything works. But this setup is very tightly coupled. Each class knows exactly what it's talking to. And that's fine early on, but it becomes painful the moment we want to change or extend anything. So the first thing I would do is start with interfaces, not concrete mono behaviors. Starting with interfaces gives us a few big advantages. Classes depend on behavior, not concrete types. Swapping or extending functionality doesn't require rewiring everything. Logic becomes easier to test outside of play mode, and systems become reusable instead of one-off. We're not making our game more complicated, we're just making the relationships more flexible. So let's start by introducing an interface that will represent something that can take damage. For now, it only needs a single method, take damage, which takes in an amount. We're not saying what this thing is, just that it supports taking damage. This gives us a shared contract we can use anywhere that damage is applied. Now let's add an interface to represent a weapon in our game. For now, it only needs one method, fire, and that method can take in a target. Notice that the target is going to be typed as an I damageable, not a specific enemy. This is where we start to break the tight coupling. So now in our player class, we can update to depend on these interfaces instead of concrete types. The player no longer cares what the weapon is or what the target is, only that they support the behavior it needs. So at this point, the player is already more flexible without changing any gameplay. We can update our call to the weapon's public method and pass the target in. Now our weapon is no longer tightly coupled to an enemy. We can pass in any I damageable at runtime. Next, we can update our weapon class to explicitly implement the iWeapon interface. Inside Fire, the weapon no longer needs to know who it's firing at ahead of time. It simply receives something damageable and applies damage. Finally, we can update the enemy to implement iDamageable. The enemy is now opting into the damage system by implementing the interface. Nothing else in the system needs to know that this is specifically an enemy. It just knows that it can take damage. At this point, the gameplay hasn't changed at all. Pressing space still damages the enemy, but structurally, we've made a big improvement. The player can use any object in our game as a weapon as long as it implements the iWeapon interface, and the weapon can damage anything in our game that implements the iDamageable interface, not just a specific enemy. This one shift is what enables everything else we'll do later. Better testing, cleaner logic, and far less refactoring as the project grows. Now that we've introduced interfaces, it's really simple to start writing some unit tests. Most of you will already have the test framework installed. I'm using the latest 1.6. You can make testing as simple or as complicated as you want. If you're just getting started with unit testing, an easy way is to use the context menu from your project window. Choose Create Testing Tests Assembly Folder. This will automatically generate a folder which contains an assembly definition file that's configured specifically for unit tests. I also need to create an assembly definition for the code I've just been writing. So I'll right click and select Create Scripting Assembly Definition. You can name your assembly definitions anything that you want, but they do have to be unique. And if you change the file name of your assembly definition, you should also change the name property in the inspector. Now my code has a dependency on the Unity input system. So I'm going to add that as a reference. Scroll down a little bit in the inspector and click Apply. Now, if we come down into our newly made tests folder and select our tests assembly definition, here we can add a reference to the example assembly definition, along with the references to the two Unity test runners that were already included. Then just scroll down and click apply. And now we're ready to make our first test class. We can right click, go to create, come down to testing again, and click on C Sharp test script. I'm going to call this weapon tests. And let's jump back into Rider. So Unity gives you a file that has the basic structure for creating unit tests. I'm going to empty it out and we'll start from scratch. The first thing I'm going to add is the standard test attribute from the nUnit library. This marks a method as a test case that executes entirely within one frame. We're just going to write one simple test. We'll call it fire deals damage to target. We'll set up our unit tests in stages, arrange, act, and assert. In the arrange section, we'll set up the test's initial state and dependencies, including all the objects, data, and mocks that we need. 
So let's set up our weapon. Since weapon is still a mono behavior at this stage, we create a game object and we'll add weapon as a component. Now a unit test just verifies the behavior of a small isolated piece of code under some specific conditions. We only want to test one method from the weapon class itself. So instead of involving the enemy class, what we can do is make a fake damageable that implements the iDamageable interface. This is also known as a test double. It's just a stand-in object that just replaces a real dependency. Instead of modifying health or playing effects, we just track how much damage was applied. This gives us something concrete we can assert against in a test. So now if we come down to the arrange section of our test for our target, we can use our fake damageable instead of a real enemy. This is only possible because our weapon now depends on I damageable, not enemy. Now in the act section of our test, we're going to call fire and pass in our fake target. Finally, we can assert that the target took the expected amount of damage. We've hard coded the value of 10 in our code right now, but if this value were to change or if the damage isn't applied, the test would fail immediately. Let's also do a little bit of cleanup. Since we created a game object for the test, we can clean it up at the end. All right, well, let's go try it out. I'll just come up to Window. Under General, we can select the test runner. I'm just going to dock it up by my inspector. Now, you can also use the test runner to create folders, assembly definitions, and test scripts, either in edit mode or in play mode. The one that we created from the context menu has an assembly definition that's specifically set up for play mode. Play mode tests have a little bit more overhead than an edit mode test because it runs the test within the context of a game scene with full access to the engine features like physics and update calls. So I've clicked run all and you can see the test doesn't take very long. We briefly see the little scene that Unity made and our tests show as all green. Now, we don't really need that test to be a play mode test. All we really have to do is come over to the test assembly definition, uncheck any platform, deselect all, and just include the editor. Let's apply those changes, come back to the test runner. Now you see that our tests show up under edit mode. Editor mode tests are very fast because they avoid that overhead of entering play mode. Let's click run all again and make sure that we're still green. Now, writing unit tests wasn't really one of my tips for today. And I know that game developers don't like writing unit tests. But hopefully this example shows how using interfaces makes testing almost effortless. And I encourage you to write at least one test for a core piece of logic in your next project. It'll change how you think about your code. So this brings us to the next tip, which is to separate logic from mono behaviors. This gives us some big wins. Core behavior can run without unity. Logic becomes trivial to test. Mono behaviors can focus on life cycle and scene integration and not decision making. So let's keep going with our weapon and we'll introduce a new plain C sharp class called weapon logic. We can pass the damage value in through the constructor and the logic itself is extremely simple for now, at least when fire is called, we apply the damage to whatever target is passed in. This class knows nothing about game objects, transforms or unity life cycles. Now we can update our weapon mono behavior to hold an instance of weapon logic. The mono behavior no longer is the logic. It just owns it. Unity is still responsible for setup and timing, but not behavior. When the player calls fire, the mono behavior simply forwards that call to the logic class. This keeps the public API the same, but changes where the work actually happens. An immediate payoff is in our test class. We no longer need a game object or a mono behavior at all. Instead, we just create weapon logic directly. This is possible because it's no longer tied to Unity. Now our test is completely focused on behavior, not concrete game objects. We can also remove this cleanup step. Let's run our tests again and make sure everything's working. I've reloaded the domain, just going to hit run all again. Should see all green in just a second. Looks good. Now let's take this even further by removing hard coded values and pushing configuration out of the logic entirely. Moving configuration into data gives us some important benefits. Balance changes don't require code changes. Logic stays focused on behavior. Designers can tweak values safely and tests will become even more clear and more explicit. Our goal here is simple. Code decides what happens, data decides the values. I've moved all of my mono behaviors into their own files so it's a little bit easier to read. And I've made a new file here named weapon config. We'll use a scriptable object since it's a natural fit for a shared editable data in Unity. For now, it's just going to contain a single field, damage. We can also use the create asset menu attribute here so that we can create some instances of this inside the editor. 
Now let's come back to our weapon mono behavior and reference this config. This way we can assign values from the inspector instead of hard coding them. In awake, instead of passing a raw value, we pass the config into our logic. The mono behavior is still responsible for wiring things together, but not for deciding behavior. Now we can update weapon logic to store a reference to the config instead of an integer. We can inject the config through the constructor, just like before. And when we fire, we need to read the damage value from the config. So our behavior hasn't changed, but where the data comes from has. Now we need to update our test. Since weapon logic depends on a config, we can create one in memory and assign the damage value directly. We pass that config into weapon logic exactly the same way the game does at runtime. The act and assert steps stay exactly the same. We're still testing behavior, and now our values are flexible and easy to change. Always good to have a little sanity check. Let's run all tests again. Everything's green. Now, before we go any further, there's one practical problem we should address. Let's jump back to Rider. Earlier, we refactored everything to use interfaces, but Unity doesn't let us assign interfaces directly in the inspector. Now, as the game develops, our weapon might come from a factory or maybe it's supplied from our save load system. But for now, unless you have a way to serialize interfaces in the inspector, like the one we built last year on this channel, a simple solution is just to serialize mono behavior references instead. Internally, we can still store everything as interfaces. In awake, we can cast the assigned components to the interfaces we actually care about. This is where the dependency is resolved once upfront. We could also fail loudly if something is misconfigured. So if a component doesn't implement the required interface, we could find out immediately instead of getting a null reference later. So early on, this approach works well. It keeps things simple while enforcing clean boundaries. In the future, these dependencies will probably be injected from a higher level system. Now let's move on to step number four, which is to isolate control flow with events. Up to this point, our player has been checking input directly and deciding what to do every frame. That approach works, but it mixes together two responsibilities, detecting input and deciding behavior. An event-driven approach separates these concerns. Instead of constantly asking, is something happening? Our code reacts when something meaningful occurs. This leads to clearer intent, fewer conditionals in gameplay code, and makes it much easier to reuse the same behavior from places other than player input, like AI, UI, or networking later on. Now, we have a whole video about building an abstraction layer over Unity's input system, but we could start by creating a new class that's called player input. This class is only responsible for turning raw input into intent. Instead of exposing key checks, we're gonna expose an event. Inside of update, we still read from the input system, but instead of acting directly, we raise the event. This is the only place that's gonna care about keyboards, buttons, or timing. Everything else just listens. Now we can update player so that it reacts to the event instead of polling input itself. So let's serialize a reference to player input so we can wire it up in the inspector. In awake, we can subscribe to the fire pressed event. We'll move the fire logic into its own method we'll call on fire. We're gonna execute the same logic we would have executed in our update method. And now in fact, we don't need the update method at all. Let's just make sure that we unsubscribe when the player's destroyed. So by moving to event-driven input, we've removed the control flow from our gameplay logic. If you were to go a little bit further and implement an interface for your player input, you can imagine how easy it would be to swap out player controls for another system, for example, AI controls. Very useful when you start writing play mode tests. Now, for today's last tip, I wanna talk about using a registry. Up until now, we've avoided talking about targeting entirely. The player knew who to shoot, and that was good enough. But once you have multiple enemies, dynamic spawning or destruction, that approach stops scaling. This is where people usually reach for scene searches or physics queries or direct references everywhere. A registry is one way to solve that problem cleanly. It's not the only way to solve this problem, but it's an easy way to keep track of a whole collection of things. So we can define a generic registry that's static, type-based, and stores a collection of items. Each type gets its own registry automatically. We never create it. The runtime does that for us when it's first needed. So let's expose a try add method that'll guard against null and try to add that item into our hash set. Likewise, removal will be just as simple. If the item exists, it's removed. If not, nothing breaks. Now we need a way to query the registry for an item. For simple cases, we could just grab the first available item. This is useful early on or for very basic behavior, but we might wanna have a more sophisticated way of selecting something from the registry. So let's make a delegate here. I'll call it selection strategy of type T. 
This way, instead of hard coding selection logic into the registry, we can pass it in. The registry owns the data, the caller owns the decision. Finally, let's also expose all registered items if a system needs full visibility. Now, with the registry in place, we can update the enemy to register itself. So we can have an awake method where the enemy just registers itself as soon as it becomes active. And if the enemy gets destroyed, it can unregister itself. This way, the registry always reflects the current state of the world. We can make use of this in our player class. We don't need to serialize a reference to one single enemy anymore. So I can remove the serialize field and we can clean up our awake method a little bit. Now, when the player fires, it can just ask the registry for a target. The simple version, of course, is to get the first eye damageable from the registry, but that's probably not very useful. It would be better for us to pass in our own selection strategy. Maybe in this case, we could make a strategy called get closest. Now, the different strategies you want to use for targeting could be supplied from a factory or maybe a builder class. But for now, let's keep the selection logic inside the player. This will keep the example simple and readable for now, and it's easy to extend later. This method implements the same signature as the delegate we defined earlier. Let's keep track of the closest valid target we found so far, and we can initialize the minimum distance to the largest possible value so that the first valid candidate always wins. Then we loop through every registered candidate in the system. Let's guard against null entries. Then we can check whether or not the candidate is a unity component. The idamageable interface doesn't guarantee a transform, so we can safely skip anything that isn't a unity object. Then let's calculate the distance between the player and the candidate using their world position. If this candidate is closer than anything we've seen so far, let's update our tracking values. And at the end of the loop, closest will hold the nearest valid target. Now, there might be some occasions when the registry has nothing to return. So let's just check and make sure that as long as the target isn't null, we go ahead and use our weapon on that target. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you're probably going to have more than one targeting strategy. So it'd be good to supply that as part of your configuration, maybe from some kind of factory. I guess I'll leave that up to you. This is just a simple example of how you could use the registry. And with that being said, that's where I'm going to wrap it up for today. Hopefully for some of you who are beginners or even if you're at the intermediate stage, you find this helpful. Feel free to join us on Discord if you like. Hit that bell so you don't miss next week's video. We've got a new video every Sunday. I'll link a few of the videos I mentioned during this video in the description. And I'll throw another one up on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.